All right, we're back. Thank you very much. So, again, um, Ryan, what are the hashtags and how do people ask questions if they want to ask questions? Again, the hashtags are uh, WCMIA, MBA, and in the Slack channel, um, do the at ampersand uh, Ryan Kinney. Awesome. All right. So uh, we've picked a couple of them that have already come in, and as time allows, we're going to go forward. So, um, Ryan, do you want to ask the first question? Yes. Our first question is uh, for Sherry. Um, you discussed a little bit uh, about not making enemies of yourself um, and uh, clients. We had a question regarding, um, do you have any tools or tips for not making enemies of your family, i.e., i.e., uh, your spouse? And what do you do when your spouse or your family aren't necessarily supportive of your endeavors um, and may have a negative uh, feelings toward what you're trying to accomplish. Would you like a microphone, Sherry? <laughs> yeah, okay. um, I'm, I suspect I'm probably not the only person on this panel who has feedback about this. But um, I think, so some of my background that maybe I didn't say is I've been married to Rob Walling for 18 years. And um, I was very young. Um, so we've gone through this entrepreneur, entrepreneurial journey together, and a big, I mean, there are many, many things that make the difference, but I think one of the things that's been super important in our family, which is not going to be at all surprising, but it's, it's really open communication about what's going on. So the difference between sitting at dinner with someone and they're like on their phone and distracted, and the frustration that that causes when you don't know why, but if you know, there's a simple explanation of like, a server's down, I'm checking in with somebody, like there's a situation happening, that's why I'm doing this, and it will be over at a certain time. So the, the explanation of the stress or the distraction is a big game changer in terms of what it feels like to be in partnership or the significant other of someone who's also growing a business. And sometimes a business can feel like a, a second significant other, like it's the other woman. So I have complicated feelings about Drip as an email marketing company. Um, but you, you kind of like develop this, this sort of uh, way of talking about that and joking about that and explaining it and putting it out into the water so that it, it doesn't breed frustration and resentment, which of course is the enemy of any healthy relationship. Anybody else in the panel want to mention something? Mm. The, what, what you just mentioned about um, the explanation for why your attention is not focused is something I've learned the hard way, actually through counseling, marriage counseling, because entrepreneurship's hard. So every once in a while, we, we go to the marriage counselor to get a little tune-up, and she, that's what she said. She's like, Josh, you can't just do. You have to explain why you do, and then things will be a lot easier. So i just reiterating that point. I married a psychologist, and that solved the problem for me. <laughs> That's good. All right. Um, our next question uh, comes from uh, Twitter, and it's wondering what the panel feels is the break point. Uh, when is it time to let a client go? And um, when do you push through, and, and how do you push through that negativity? So. Um, it can get, it can be hard to get to a point where you want to just say, we're going to walk away. But the biggest decision maker for me is if a client is flat out rude, disrespectful, like just completely unprofessional, swearing at people, whatever, we're probably done. I mean, that's, you know, you, 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 you want to protect your people. And if they're being complete jerks and, you know, words we're not going to say on the live stream to that, then we're, we're just going to walk away. I would agree with that. Uh, I think 
we probably have a zero tolerance policy for abusive behavior and there's a really big difference between an angry person that's frustrated that you could probably win over uh, with great service and attention to detail and someone who's being just flat out abusive, right? When you talked about the Amazon review, I was cracking up because one of my like most traumatic moments, right, was like someone left a review on Calera Forms and was like, it literally said, Chrissy Chirinas is absolutely useless. First and last name, absolutely useless. And I was like, I'm not useless. <laughs> like, I can, like you use the plugin at some point, right? Um, and there's a big difference between like someone's angry and you can make a difference here, you can turn this person into a huge advocate and like they're just calling your names, right? And identifying that is important. Actually, follow-up question based on that because if you could give her the mic. Um, in Sherry's presentation we said, I love, I love my customers and they love me. Um, this falls into sort of that category. How, how do you deal with that sort of, oh my gosh, that moment of that, what she just described? Breaking up is hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I, I do think, you know, stepping back, that's where it's really important to have other relationships in your life, personal relationships, colleague relationships, relationships with customers that feel like they're healthy and there's a healthy feedback loop, so that you can tell the difference between a good relationship and a bad relationship. I think when we're in the weeds and we're like, I just have to get the things on my to-do list done, it becomes difficult to do that bigger picture reflection to decide, like, is, is this, can I really provide a great service to this person? And is this the right relationship for me to be in professionally? And to be brave enough to say, this isn't a fit. It's not a good relationship. It's not working well. And it's not in the best interest of anybody's time to continue on forever. Okay. Thank you. Uh, for the next question, I'm going to ask Syed, um, because I've actually heard some great stuff from him at a, an event we did together. Um, what are some of the routines you have implemented in your personal life that have also helped you on your entrepreneurial journey? Man, I'm constantly trying to uh, tweak and iterate. Uh, one of the most helpful things was waking up early in the morning. Um, and I did that, but now it's challenging now that I'm a father with, 16, with a 16 month old and I'm trying to balance that. I'm going to sleep at 1.30, woke up at 5.45. I'm kind of <laughs> tired, but, uh, but setting, setting boundaries as, as the team is growing and clear definitions of, of roles. What are you okay with doing? What are you not okay with doing? And if something, sometimes things have to be done, whether it's in your business, whether it's in a client relationship, and you have to, you have to make those ends meet. But understanding you know, what are the processes that you can put to make sure that you are at the happiest while things are still going. So. Right. By the way, thank you for joining us last second like that, putting you on the spot. Um, I'd like a quick answer out of everybody if I could. Josh, what are some of the things in your routine that's helped you? Um. What has helped me? Uh, I'm I'm actually terrible with routines. Um, that's that's that, a good thing. To that is actually that. Sally's strong suit, where I am much more just uh, lackadaisical and kind of. But <clears throat> I have learned to embrace some routines, and they've been quite helpful. And um, uh, always use the calendar for scheduling team meetings. Nice. And you time box them and. You know, we have 30 minutes here. At 31 minutes, you're, we're done. We have other shit we got to do, stuff we got to do. So sticking to the, not letting meetings run long. Yeah. And, and using the calendar to manage it. Because if you count the salaries of everybody in that meeting, yeah. it, it gets, it, it's a waste. So not only did we have a question, which we'll get to on, on the podcast about uh, family life and how to deal with that, but we also have a lot of questions around this. And I struggle with sort of the ADHD moment of what do you do? Time boxing really helps, I agree with you. Sherry, what do you think about the, uh, the types of routines that have helped you as an entrepreneur or can help entrepreneurs? I think there are, there are two that I think are really important. Uh, one is taking a vacation. Like, it really, no matter how like, cash-strapped you are, or how early you are in your process, like, take 
a week, really at minimum 10 days off, let your body reset, let your brain think about different yeah. things, have different kinds of experiences. So vacations are really, they're really important and it's really easy to rationalize not taking them. The other thing that, um, that we have done and that thing we talk about a lot in Zen Founder is the practice of taking a retreat, which is not a vacation. It's like a deep dive into your business. It's the time to kind of ask big picture questions, to think about goals and directions for your business over the course of time. But again, it's out of the day to day. It's not a to-do list. You don't answer email while you're on a retreat. It's a really intense deep dive in and I think that really helps you feel really present and also newly motivated and energized um, to keep moving forward. Thank you. Christy? Um, unlike Josh, both Josh on this panel and the Josh in my life that I work with, um, I'm the queen of routine. Um, I think the most important thing with that is know yourself, right? Like if you're not someone that gets benefit from a routine, you're not going to get benefit out of making yourself get into routine. I don't think. I think there's probably a sweet spot there. Um, but for me, um, I love routine. I think that it helps me minimize the number of decisions that I have to make in a day. I think that it sets me up for success in a day of running around all day. Um, I'm big on morning routines, right? Like I actually am the person, like that person that like gets up every morning and then like makes a cup of green tea, brushes her teeth, like puts on, does yoga, does 10 minutes of meditation, drinks the green tea, gets rest, goes out the door, right? Like every single day. Um, and that really helps, and I find that really beneficial. Um, I also got into like minimalist fashion to minimize the number of decisions I have to make about what to wear each day, <laughs> <laughs> and like the Mark Zuckerberg like hoodie thing. Um, but for women, it's like a whole thing, right? Like you actually like design your closet around having every single piece match. Um, and I find these things comforting, but I think that it's a know yourself thing. I think right. that I know so many people in my life um, that like conventional wisdom would say like, well, wouldn't this all be solved by routine? But I could see them getting even more stressed out by being told like, well, but now like you need to establish a routine. And so finding something else is probably useful. Okay. Thank you. So for those of you who don't know, um, at crowd favorite, the way we grew is we treated every single uh, department as a business unit. So Pat is brought to thinking, I have to think as an entrepreneur and I manage my team and they have their own budget and their own uh, revenue goals. And so he's really running his own little mini company. So when we ask him about how he's had to do routine, he's one of the people who's gone from freelancer to managing a team of tens of developers uh, on a daily basis. So what kind of routine has helped you move from being sort of that freelance state of mind to working with a small agency and then working with a large team? Living in Google Calendar is the most fundamental thing I've done. Um, if it's not in the calendar, what did I say? If, it, if, I don't, if you don't write it down, it doesn't exist. If it's not in the calendar, it's not a, it, no, it doesn't happen. Uh, so, I mean, I just, I need, an, I need an autoresponder that goes right back into Slack that somebody's like, hey, can I do this, da 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 and it's like five questions, and I'm like, it, I'm in two meetings right now. Go away. So the calendar is, is useful because it takes the, you know, like the fashion thing, it takes the decision-making out of your head. You put it down. Once that's gone, it's out of my head. It's not occupying space that I have to use to think about other things. Uh, and pre-fill it out as much as you can because then you're planning your week, you're planning your month, and that certainty is so comforting and, and lessens the mental chaos. Uh, the second thing is, is uh, something I've started having our team do, and it's called show your work. Uh, if, I, if I come to Kareem with something and I don't already have a couple of ideas and a couple of options, and this is what we went through, kind of like what Josh was saying on the turn the ship around, if I'm not bringing him some, this is what I know, here's some assumptions, we could think about this, what do you think? He's going to look at me and like, you're completely wasting my time. And he's right. Uh, you don't just go, hey, this isn't working. It's like, okay, great. What did you try? What did you do? Uh, what caused it? You know, what was going on? So I'm pushing that down to my team as much as I can because it has been what works at my level. 
And so it just it encourages everybody to be those self-starters, which makes the routine easier. <laughs> So for this question, we're going to ask for volunteers, whoever wants to uh, uh, posit a, an answer. Um, how to accept or deal with my first, uh, a new client who tells you up front, my first freelancer messed up the project, used half my budget, so I can't afford your quote. How, to, how do you transition them to get the value uh, that you have to offer? You just walk away. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's what you do when you just start. If you're, as, as you go, you realize if you don't offer it, somebody else is offering that. And you do a revenue share deal with them. And then you take 10% of every, every lead that you send that way. <laughs> Syed is a master class right here. I love this. Oh, all right. All right, doing the random thing. Um, Kareem, while you do that real quick, yeah. can I ask your name, Miss? Kayla? Kayla is a great listener. Like, as speakers, it's really nervous to be up here, but she's an active listener, and I just want to say thank you, because you, it was comforting to look over there and just see a nodding head and a... <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you take some notes. Just thank you. It's great. You could be a therapist, too, if the whole <laughs> All right, um, here's one for Sherry Walling. What advice do you have for dealing with emotional gaslighting by clients? With, gaslighting even this without firing them. So gaslighting uh, when they're trying to get you upset, I would imagine. Or, con or convince you that you're the problem. Right. This is this is a business problem. Well, well, I'll yeah. well, show you choose on that for a second. So we we talk about when we talk about setting client expectations, um, a lot of your communication is going to be verbal. If you're doing it right, even remotely video guys, I can't stress video enough. Um, but after you have that conversation, send an email with a couple of bullet points. This is what we discussed. That's what's going to stop that, because the minute they gaslight you, they're going to actually you can say. I understand how you're feeling. I understand what you're going through. Feeling. Um, but um, I think my notes reflect something else. Let's, let's talk about that. That's the, the business answer to do that. Um, and if they're going to be at all reasonable, um, they're going to sort of come back to the table and re-engage you. If not, what's jo what Josh said about the last answer. <laughs> yeah, I think that's where your capacity for self-reflection is, again, another superpower as an entrepreneur. Because if your default is to be pretty, pretty congenial, pretty, like, okay with most people, but suddenly you, with this particular kind of client, begin to feel irritated and frustrated, and you begin to feel things that aren't necessarily your default way of interacting with clients, that's your first hint that there's, there's some kind of emotional process that's happening where they're, they're I'm going to use the, the language of my field, they're projecting something onto you and it's sticking to you. And so you're acting out of that. And I think it's really actually, I think, very important to be able to recognize when you're stuck in an emotional process that you don't own and you don't want to live in. And that I think probably precedes being able to make a good business decision is being able to recognize when it's happening in the first place. And part of that is really paying attention to your, to your emotional life and right. paying attention to those clients that are getting under your skin in ways that seem inexplicable. Okay. So we're passing that, the number of books we have here. So I think, uh, I think we have a limit on that, but I encourage you to keep asking questions because we will answer them on Sherry's podcast, Zen Founder, as well as do a sort of more business, uh, a, a more business uh, oriented uh, video with the, uh, the speakers who will participate. And uh, we'll get that information out through all the uh, WordCamp Miami channels. But there are some very good questions here. Mike, for instance, um, we all struggle these days in today's culture with the difference between creating a business and then 
some people who are in the business then create a personal brand, right? And people have a trouble distinguishing with that. Question here is, should freelancers using their personal brand create a separate identity for that business? If so, how would you start? So, you know, I'm gonna clarify a little bit for our panel, but you know, you're a freelancer and now you've got a volume of work that you actually wanna start building a team. What's the point to, to make that shift? Right? I, I, think, I think Syed's got a lot of experience in, in this because he's got a very good, high profile personal brand and successful businesses. Yeah, I guess I never really tried to create a personal brand. I created separate brands and then those brands kind of built my brand um, around it. So if most people, like if you go on WP Beginner, you never really see my name on it um, unless you go to the about page. Same thing in Optin Monster, same thing on Monster Insights or WP Forms. But um, over time, you know, the brand kind of, because we were doing good stuff, the brand came, you know, the personal brand kind of built on its own. But I have a lot of uh, friends who have, who have done it the other way. Um, you know, they, they created their personal brand and then that's, that's, they were freelancers, started getting a lot of work and their name kind of became the thing. It all depends on what your end goal is, right? You, it's kind of hard to sell SayedBalky.com. Um, if, if, if your end goal is to exit out, it's, it's easier to exit out with a brand um, than, than your personal brand. For example, uh, a real good friend of mine, Neil Patel, he has Neil Patel Digital. Right, that's his, that's his agency that, that he uses to do marketing, etc. It's practically impossible for him to exit out of Neil Patel Digital. He can appoint a manager and step away, right? But people aren't really going to buy Neil Patel Digital. They might buy his book of business and move that over, but it's impossible to buy that personal brand. So just keep in mind of what, your, what your end goals are. For example, in December, we sold two of our business unit in Wire Gallery and Soliloquy. Uh, and you know, while the personal brand aspect that I had helped, you know, elevate the corporate brand, it, it was easy for us to sell it um, because it wasn't tied to me personally. And, and at the same time, get a, get a fairly decent multiple. So. Anybody else want to take a stab at that? I'll, I would just say maybe we're not lawyers and a lawyer's a, a, a law office is Perker, Kleins, and Mar, Marbury or something. They, so it doesn't make sense in a digital space, I think, to use a personal brand to run a business. Um, I would say that this sounds like a question of competitive advantage to me, right? Like if people are buying your services from your freelance practice because you've established a strong personal brand about like, you are the person who knows a lot about this particular thing, then it might make sense to continue with that. But as a fact, that's not a sellable business, right? Because like they can't buy you. But if that's what the entire premise of your freelance practice is, then that's what the entire premise of your freelance practice is. That's a thing that you're going to have to identify and make a decision. If your clients for your service business are coming because you have figured out a process of taking their request and documenting it really well and then passing it on to a developer, that's a different story than you're selling like you and your face going to stuff saying that you're really good at something. So. Right. So, so what are you, huh? Okay, please. Yeah, no, this is a good topic. Yeah, uh, one thing I forgot to add. Uh, you know, what is, what is the one thing that people want from a personal brand versus a corporate brand? It's you, your character. There, there are certain traits of your character that people are attracted to. That's what they trust. Um, and one thing that I believe that we've done really, really well is create um, a character for each of our brand. Um, and it's actually used in, and it's, it's a technique that we stole pretty much from Hollywood screenwriters, uh, a concept of character diamonds. And essentially, each one of our brand has those qualities that I, that I feel attracts people to us, makes them see that, okay, you know, this is, this is why they want to follow us. This, this, is the, this is why they relate to us. Um, and, you know, this is why they keep coming back. And what this allows you to do is build a scalable organization, have other people who are 
who fit into that character diamond. And you can assess that at the time of hiring um, through, through various techniques. And so it's a, it's a good exercise. Look, look up you know, how, character diamonds and how you, how you can do that, because that's what people are really attracted to. Um, you, know, you can watch a Superman movie from the 60s or you know, 90s or whatever, and you still love Superman. No matter who plays it, it's still the same Superman. Um, and a lot of the good personal brands that have evolved in the organization have taken that concept um, where the thought leader uh, example, uh, Ryan Dice, for example, pulled himself out, a digital marketer, have a team running it, but people still like, you know, follow that concept. Okay, so this is why these panels are so valuable. You've gotten an answer from literally the beginning of the journey of being a freelancer all the way up to creating multiple brands. That's amazing, like between all these answers. But for the, for the folks in the room, here's something that's very, very important that I ask all freelancers. It comes down to money, personal brand versus a brand. Are you going to be marketing yourself on your particular skill? How many hours in a week can you sell? And what's your billable rate? Are you telling me that's the, all the money you're ever going to make? Because if you're that good at what you're doing, that you're going to charge that much money, like licensed professionals do, then awesome. Keep that personal brand, in my opinion. But if you want to scale that service, if your service is replicable, then personally, I would think about what does it look like beyond a personal brand? Christy, you had a follow-up. Can I talk about the middle of that path too, right? Sure. Because that's something that we started experiencing, which was, um, you know, like when you have a strong personal brand and you put out a product, your personal brand's followers are like, oh, so-and-so put out a product, right? Um, but that can only go so far. And we actually asked this question. We said, well, what happens when the thing that people love about our product is when they email us, they can talk to the person who made it? Well, that, you know, like that is count, that will never happen alongside growth, right? Like that's gonna go away, right? Um, that, that cannot be your competitive advantage. It's just never gonna work. You are a person, you only have 24 hours in a day and eight of those are wasted sleeping, right? Spent, intelligently spent sleeping. Valuable time. Awesome. And, um, so we asked that question, right? And the answer to that question is you're going to extract what the founder is so good at and you're going to make it a nameless process that anyone can do. And that's how you go from um, your advantage in the market. It's like you're really good at something to your advantage in the market is you have created an army of use and you can sell the army of use. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you to our panelists. Uh, if you're in the room and you actually had a question answered, please come down and see us. Um, if you're online and you did, please get in touch with Ryan Kinney or myself uh, through Twitter. We'll get in touch with you. And we will be uh, putting out on all the broadcast streams uh, about Sherry's podcast for her AMA based on this session and on the business video that we'll do to answer those questions. Thank you again, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you for coming. We work at Miami. And don't forget, there are no vegan meals.